Well, the Union ended the last turn with one more PC than the Confederates, I think 11 to 10 or something like that. Without any increase beyond that, you know, we got some automatic uh, improvements. The Union, I think, took one here, maybe one here, I don't remember for sure, uh, where they increased their forces. Uh, the problem is, I built lots of navies again. Three more ships. That's a big expense. Two points each. I think maybe in the first video uh, I played it out as one each because somebody made a comment along those lines. I Certainly at, at certain points in the game, I, I, since that first play, I, I've been correct about it. Um, and uh, the Confederates built up here and they also built Lee up. Now, I'm planning on railing Lee to take command of the Petersburg uh, stuff, I think. Although, uh, basically, I have no PCs left, so I can't suck down, you know, these TCO units here. Uh, I didn't see that as a worthwhile expenditure. I built another... Uh, not another, yeah, I built another Raider and I built another asset this time in New Orleans. This had gotten bumped over to Pensacola. I'm pretty sure that's not where it was. Um, adding, this is going to add to the defense of New Orleans, except that it's not. <laughs> but the Union doesn't know that. Not a terribly big deal, though, since the Union has spent their 10 PCs, all, all, all of them. Um, they bought some CSPs. You know, that that's the real iffy question is, is it worth buying the combat points? But if you don't buy them, your opponent can get the jump on you everywhere. Uh, and then uh, I also upgraded, let's see, I didn't buy Ashby back, which is kind of weird. But I upgraded, he's not a terribly good combat rating, so... Trying to see what else I might have done, and it's not really coming to mind. Uh, oh, yeah, I improved. Uh, I promoted Jackson, who's cheaper to promote than Johnson because Johnson's political poison, right? So now Jackson's in charge of the army, and he's got three stars. That means I've got a functioning army here in uh, Virginia. Of course, it's stuck at Richmond, but. Eh, whatever, you know. The Confederates certainly were pushed back to Richmond at one point. Uh, the loss of the valley area, or at least the area near the valley, is a little painful. But other than that, I'm not quite sure. You know, it's so hard to... There aren't a lot of things that really drive you in this game. The only thing that really does is this track, and I'm probably not using it to the best ability, but it's really hard to get the points that indicate that you're doing well across the board. Um, over here, by the time the Union had their 10 points, I don't think they were doing very well, so I think again I failed to get the Emancipation Proclamation in play. Uh, I remember something about Washington. Ah, so this is what I missed. Intervention may take place earlier if a Union three-star CO uh, suffers a major, can, sustains a major defeat or retreats before battle north of the north-south border or if the Confederates take Washington. We haven't had any of that happen yet. Uh, I don't think this is up to a major army yet. It can't be with Siegel. Uh, so at this point, really, the Union's kind of looking at the possibility of maybe cutting the supply lines of this army. Right now it's drawing it off the Arkansas River, I think that is, but I'm not sure. Without words on the... Without names on the rivers, I can't really tell for sure. I know this is the Ohio. Um, but I don't remember. 
think this is the Arkansas and this may be, I don't know, I'll just make myself seem stupider than I am, or as stupid as I am, whichever one you want. Anyway, uh, we're, we're in this, uh, you know, a situation where, yeah, at the end of the game, you want the Mississippi River. It's worth victory points. But other than cutting the supplies so that the, uh, the Trans-Mississippi can't really maintain a big army anymore, there's not a lot of real reason for that. Now, the Trans-Mississippi is pretty damn important to me right now because Kentucky is being left vacant. So I have a few choices with the Union. One is to try to plow into Kentucky. Of course, I've still got to meet my requirements over in Virginia. And there's a desire, right? There's additional points if I do attacks and stuff in Virginia. I don't know if I remembered to get a point for this, and I don't know if I was due one. Uh, you know, <laughs> the, the different interactions in this game are kind of a tangled mess to me. It doesn't seem that complex a game, and in a lot of ways it shouldn't be, but you've got to just, I've got to keep looking things up in a way that is very painful. Anyway, uh, here I am slowly churning through very little activity and I don't know what I'm doing with that but that almost I don't know if that's my mood or if it's something about the game itself but we're moving into the naval phase here and again the unions forced to go first in everything here is kind of a disadvantage uh, so I guess I'll do all my naval operations See, this is the weird thing. Perform naval operations in order, as if this is not to be handled inside the phase. <sighs> anyway, I, I, if that's the case, then I can move and screw these raiders over uh, before they get their roll. Hit my seven points of blockade points. I have one extra fleet to place. Um, I've got my five... Six, seven, Norfolk's very easy to blockade. It's also fairly easy to capture. Now here's the question. If I place this down in Galveston or something, I immediately cause one IT on the Confederates. But one IT is pretty minor compared to losing the possibility of a CSP. So I'm going to place here. Uh, what that's going to do is it's going to force the cruiser to move. But by having blocked this cruiser in, I think it's going to be harder for it to move. So I have to look at that roll. Yeah, it doesn't look like that's an effect, so I'm able to shift here. Now let me see about shifting raiders. I know there's a rule about that too. If the raider is unopposed, I know I can't attack with it because I shifted it, but... You know, during raiding operations, the Confederate player always goes first. Son of a bitch. Well, the Union went for... What the hell? That's this, which is the actual attacks. That's all. Which means, even though the Union went first, the Confederate gets a chance to move away, I think. But let me see. Changing columns, 8.1.1. What the hell? That's not under Raiders. Oh, there's another roll on Raiders. Okay, this is... Yeah. So I'm trying to leave a completely blockaded port. So I have to roll a die. On a 3 through 6, the Raider succeeds. On a 1 or 2, it's captured and sunk. So this one made it out and made it to there. Uh, I may shift one Raider either to either empty adjacent column, I'm doing it to there. Or I can actually also go back to port. Um, and at this point, the Union fleets that we're hunting aren't going to get anything. Only this raider is going to do anything. So he hits on a four through six. Five, he kills one of these CSPs that I bought. All right, I think that's the naval move. Now I gotta go to the rail moves. 
um, those are going to require a little bit of thought. I knew what I was going to do, but and I know Lee, for example, is moving up, but I don't really remember what I was going to do with the Union. Lots of rail movement available. I consolidated all my uh, Western forces for a possible attack. Looking at the Henry and Donaldson as being a fairly easy uh, thing. Now, like I said, the way the rules are written, it looks like these don't provide any PCs when you capture them. So it's just handing five to the Confederacy. But as things stand right now, there's a lot of points open deep in the, uh, deep in the territory beyond Kentucky and Tennessee and onward. But there's not a lot defending against. They got Buckner and Pillow, and that's not an impressive. Uh, they both, they're both ear, uh, uh, ear something. <laughs> I don't remember what the term is. Indecisive. Uh, generals for defense, which is kind of cool. They'll be uh, not particularly impressive. I also moved some more Washington troops down the rail. To here and I'm forgetting including Cav I'm always forgetting to put the RITs down because they sound like I no, they're just not on my mind uh, and then the Confederates what the hell did they do they shifted Lee and they shifted Wheeler from way back in uh, Atlanta to uh, be a secondary force in the Virginia theater Lee's now two stars, and that's pretty effective with Lee and Jackson operating as two separate armies. Kind of historical, too. But that's a lot of power to face the two Union armies there. So, I think I'm on to the operations phase, and it's time to hand out cards. The Confederates are going to get one last card, uh, because they held one, so that they'll only get seven additional cards. The Union's going to get eight. No new cards went in the deck this turn because it's a fault. Again, the choice to do other things kept me from having the 10 points necessary to do a campaign or to know that I can do naval actions. I feel like maybe I'm being too active with the Union. The Union should be uh, banking more points. They're not really gaining much here. Unfortunately, I also feel like I'm way behind, right? I haven't done anything here along the Mississippi. There, and, uh, you know, so far, yeah, I've charged into Virginia. I've got lots of uh, reasons to do that, but I don't have New Orleans. I, I, I'm not really, I haven't even taken Missouri, which I feel should have mostly fallen by this point. Uh, obviously, I'm not in Kentucky, but, you know, like I said, that seems like just a negative to go after unless there's just nothing here to fight. Uh, I can't see the historical being playing out at all when there's really no advantage to taking it and only disadvantage for invading it. Uh, you know, if I had lots and lots of activities, yeah, I'd just come slicing through here, but I've got other things I need to do. And it just doesn't look like it's worth the, the cost. So <laughs> it might just remain neutral all, year, all game. Yeah, we kick things off with some quick events. The Salmon Chase event uh, forces the Confederate to play with his cards face up. And I get to bank two PCs for that, but then the Confederates play the Claiborne Jackson. Now all their cards are up now, so the Union knows what they can do. Uh, this added a bunch of PCs to the bank, up to, well, double the last Union card, which would be 10, but no more than 6. Uh, it's a quick gain. You know, doing something with a card, rather than taking that many PCs, seems silly. The PCs are very valuable to this game. In fact, they're what kind of drive it. That's going to be points that I have for next turn or, well, that's pretty much what it comes down to. So you want to gather as many PCs as you can. <coughs> for one thing, you can take campaigns if you have 10, but it's hard to judge whether or not you're going to have many next turn when you can't see your cards beforehand. <laughs> so unless you stock them and hold on to them, at least 
a significant number. It's hard to, to guarantee that you're going to make it to 10 at any time and be able to use that campaign for any real value. It doesn't spend them. It's just you have to have them in the bank at some point during the turn. And there's such a desire to spend them all, at least on my point part of point of view, that it's hard. You know, if I only spent a few and kept myself up in this above five, I could probably guarantee that I'd play a campaign at some point. But also, a campaign doesn't give you any PCs. So it's an expensive action to take. It kills you. It kills one of your cards that could well be a good card. All right. I an overrun earlier, and I think I screwed it up. I'm not sure. No big surprise there. But I just had one. The Confederates attacked here at uh, Springfield, and they had like a plus 10. That puts 10 IPs on the uh, defend on the loser. But what it also did was totally destroy the commanding officer. Whoever that is, is reduced to one star and thrown in the disgraced general box. No TCO or anything like that left. So it wipes thing it wipes the enemy out. It also allows this force to continue moving which I may do to position myself uh, against Grant here, who's been shifting, who shifted down um, using the Union turn. It wiped out the Union PC uh, total, and the Confederates are up to 10. I can't think of anything that they can do in particular, uh, given that they don't have a campaign in their hand that's special with 10. Um, the other thing is, the Union played a peculiar general. They got total warrior. That's not... Like, you know, a great warrior. It's someone conducting total war, which means he's going to suffer less from uh, uh, being out of supply. So I'm going to continue on into our Kansas and uh, face Grant there, but I probably leave something behind. And in fact, I may leave the uh, IT behind with it going terribly wrong for the Union here by far. Uh, opened up with Mecklernand, who's erratic, so I tried to roll rather than just take a point. I came up with nothing. On the Confederate side, they threw away Henry Foote because they had 10 points. And this peculiar general here is because of the Thurlow Weed card. Um, it says, play this card at any time a US and CS force or adjacent conduct an automatic general casualty check. I assume that's on the opponent. <laughs> Doesn't make much sense otherwise. So uh, that was flipped up and came up with a star. I assume that's what's supposed to happen. A general casualty check is you flip the card and see if you hit somebody. Ends up they did. Confederates got the pick of who to hit and it was Magruder. That's kind of an iffy fellow. Just because, well, if he dies, it's not that big a deal. However, uh, he ends up getting a wound, which is a little, I mean, it's a minor problem, but nothing huge. For the Confederates, they paid a one point card. They didn't roll. They just took the point and launched an attack on Grant. You can see he was wiped. Uh, he was hit hard, nine points against him. Grant himself has been disgraced for that. Uh, we're seeing ugly stuff just happening to the Union here. And, uh, you know, then their PCs are going down. They lost a CSP. They tried to withdraw from combat and failed. Um, it didn't seem worth throwing CSPs into this battle because it was hopeless anyway. Uh, instead of nine, it would have been a six, which would put it at a major victory instead of an overrun. But I didn't know the points for sure. I should have, uh, if you can remember. But I knew it was a blowout and just didn't feel like it was worth spending what little support I have left on the board. Towards that, I'm also a little worried about this going all down to zero. Remember, the Confederates get the last play. They have this Sterling Price card, which, as long as I have generals in Missouri, or Illinois, for that matter, where Grant might withdraw to, uh, 
he can force a two-star general to leave there and cost me two PCs. Uh, and he can subtract four. I have the choice to take four PCs instead of doing that. Now this says move a one or two star general from Missouri, Arkansas, Illinois to the plains northwest. That sounds like a teleportation. So my guess is that card that required you to move to Georgia would have been a teleportation as well. That that's what's intended when a card says move someone somewhere. It's not like there's not a rail net. Um, but it would be a rather rapid repositioning in some cases. And in this case, uh, that's going to go way out here. The Union grabbed Lynchburg uh, here with Hancock. Um, that satisfies their Virginia requirement, didn't get them any points other than for Lynchburg itself. Um, meanwhile, though, Albert Sidney Johnston. Uh, demolished who was there this time Curtis into the disgraced box bang two more stars gone more PCs being turned over they just have dominance in this area and there's not much I can do about it and then slid back in front of Grant they're back in position to attack Grant with another <sighs> and you know the armies are just disintegrating for the Union over in the Trans-Mississippi Union looking for somewhere where they can win a fight marched into Kentucky. <laughs> that gives more PCs to the Confederacy, making them more potent. But uh, it did uh, cause the Confederates to play not this card. Uh, the Irregulars banking only one point. Launch an attack, uh, destroyed whatever was left. We got just Sherman there. We had uh, Mecklerin, I think, in charge. He's dead now, actually. Uh, and then I kind of dispersed my army into two spaces. I can't cross the river yet, but I'm planning on going across and fighting in the west. I feel like I've done my job in the Trans-Mississippi to the extent that I really can. Uh, I got McCulloch and Polk back here, and they took the IP with, or IT with them to head that way. Uh, and I don't know where we are beyond that. Uh, Union march down out of Fort Monroe through here. Now they took two, P, two IT uh, moving through, but then they made an attack. Butler was killed, which means we have this here, maybe I can upgrade that. But that'll release another fleet for the blockade. And for what little the blockade actually does. I don't know what this, this has got to be here. Um, at this point, because there aren't a lot of IT points to remove, uh, IT just doesn't make that much difference in general until, you know, you start getting humongous amounts. Uh, I can choose to put it on units that are kind of out of the fight. So the blockade, until it really, you know, starts hammering in, isn't going to have much effect on the Confederate force. Uh, but it will spread a minus one onto all the troops eventually if it happens. But that's not really my concern here. My concern was more getting the point. One thing to worry about, if Virginia gets conquered, there should be a proviso to kind of allow the Union not to have to keep activating troops <laughs> in Virginia. Uh, yes, they have to have a garrison there, but they'll have to keep activating it every, every uh, turn in order to avoid that one PC penalty. And maybe they can just eat the penalty and say the hell with it. But in a sense, eating that penalty is something you could do anyway if, uh, if there's no real reason to take anything. Okay, so for the Union, uh, they threw the Sheridan card and just banked the four points for that. That brings them up to 10 PC. Now, Confederates could play this Sterling Price uh, card, the Sioux Uprising, and force a general into here and take two off the Union PC points, which would drop them below 10. 
kind of meaning they won't be able to do anything too exciting next turn, even if they don't buy anything. But, you know, if they want to do a campaign or a naval action, I'm okay with that. I'd rather use the points. Continue moving. Grab Bowling Green as well. Now, why am I taking these? Is there any particular reason to do so? Uh, like I said, there's some disadvantage to taking them, but they block supply routes. Uh, they grab the rail lines. The Patico one is probably less important or unimportant, but Bowling Green uh, runs this train line. So if I can grab Lexington and or Louisville, um, I'm in a better position there. And so I think that's just worthwhile. Did I add my PCs? I don't think I did. So I'll take three more. And that puts us to the end. And we're going to do some uh, bookkeeping work where Union forces are going to start dissolving, it looks like. In a sense, the Union used their CSPs, but the Confederates wasted six of them here. <laughs> uh, one thing we can say, though, Albert Sidney Johnson is living up to his reputation that he had before the war. If only he had survived, this is what he would have done. I mean, he's... Uh, <laughs> no. But, uh, yeah, I, I mean, he's got the Sherman uh, total war ability, uh, which is pretty cool. The Union forces here are disgraced. All we have left down here is Fremen. I don't know what to do with the Union at this point. I probably surrender. Um, we have not yet met the British intervention <laughs> possibility here. Uh, but remember, we were at a point where maybe the Emancipation Proclamation could have been declared early in the game. Of course, I did cheat uh, with the Union in the, in the Northeast, and we also didn't have, uh, for whatever that mattered, uh, maybe not an advantage for the Union here, or maybe not an, uh, yeah, maybe not an advantage for the Union particularly. But we had the, uh, I forgot to use the Seeing the Elephant table. Yeah, I don't remember that from uh, what is that, P. Rich. Uh, one, one of the great battles of the American Civil War had it. Maybe Wilson's Creek, I don't know. Anyway, uh, this is where we're ending up. Huge advantage for the Confederates, which means they're going to have the bonus initiative. The, hey, the U.S. gets to go first initiative. Got to think about whether or not... What's this card? If the U.S. Uh, draws this in place of a normal card draw, use it to promote a U.S. CO who won a ma minor or major battle. Yeah, uh, that I think is no one. <laughs> so I don't want to take this into my hand in any particular way. Maybe earlier in the game I would have wanted it, but I kind of forgot about it. Uh, oh, you know, it only came in this year, and this year has been very, very bad for the Union. All right, well, we'll push on into 63. Uh, that means more cards get added in. So these decks, which we're getting awfully small, well, they're going to get replenished and probably will make it through the spring of 63. But there's a good chance the summer is going to uh, end up uh, requiring a reshuffle and the whole deck goes back into play in both cases. All right, let's send this one up, a little bit more reasonable size.